Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Preservation School class, Preserving the Art of Stone Carving. We have many virtual and in-person Six to Celebrate and conference tours and events coming up over the next few months, including the 2024 Six to Celebrate launch party on Tuesday, April 30th, and an in-person tour this Saturday, April 27th in Greenpoint. Information can be found on, on our website for all of our upcoming programming, uh, hdc.org. If you have any questions about programming, you can contact me at marbulu at hdc.org. Tonight's class will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel for free viewing. You may also watch all of our previous Preservation School classes, virtual tours, conference panels, and many, many more on our YouTube channel. I would like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, City Council, and the New York State Council on the Arts for Supporting Preservation School. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and Chris will address them at the end. Now I will hand it over to Chris Palateri to lead tonight's class. Thank you. Hello, friends. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, it's a privilege to have been asked to uh, come and share share my, my knowledge with you. And uh, so I, I'm just going to start right in and um, I'll start, I'll do so by telling I'll begin by telling my story, and uh, as always, it's best to start the story from the very beginning, so I'm going to wind back the clock and start from the very beginning. Oops. <laughs> At least uh, I think I am. I'm not quite confident, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pressing the button that I thought would advance the slides, but no, it's not doing it. I should have tried this before. I apologize. Um, it was working before. I'm doing the same thing. Um, oh, 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 I think this will do it. Yup. Yep. Here we go. Oops, I overshot. I went a little too far back. Okay, let's wind forward a little bit. Yes, yes. This is me uh, being <laughs> right after I was born and my mother. Uh, I'm at the New York um, NYU, uh, NYU Medical Center. Uh, I particularly love this slide because uh, I'm thinking a lot about my mom uh, because uh, this wonderful lady died last week and I'm dedicating this um, presentation to her. We all get a lot from our parents. Uh, in terms of developing our worldview and our our view on views on life, and uh, one of the wonderful things I got from my mother and my dad was the belief that it was possible, not guaranteed, but possible to find a, a path in life, uh, a, a work, you know, a way of making a living that one would actually enjoy. And as I've gotten older, and met more people, and 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 learned about their way of looking at life, I've seen that that's by no means universal. And it's by no means universal that people would choose something with that with that goal in mind. But I, I've been very fortunate and privileged, and it's been my joy to be a stone carver for the last uh, 35 years. So here's, here's me with my brother, Carlo, and uh, my dad's a photographer, by the way. That's why we have these beautiful black and white photographs. Um, one day my mom was walking uh, through the neighborhood. We grew up uh, at 108th and Broadway and she saw uh, in, in a bank window uh, publicity for the Cathedral School. Uh, the Cathedral School was founded as part of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And um, after some exploration and, and fact finding, she, she decided that that would be a great place for us to uh, start school once we were ready for first grade. Um, I was a chorister. I sang in the choir at the cathedral. In fact, the cathedral school was founded for the sole purpose of providing a choir to sing in the cathedral, although it became, uh, it was a boarding school initially. And uh, by the time my, my brother and I went there, it was no longer a boarding school. It was a day school and it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't just limited to boys. It was also, uh, you know, co-educational. Co but I spent a lot of time in the cathedral as a as a young man, uh, as a boy, and as a young man um, because of being in the choir. And while my brother absorbed uh, 
the musical aspect of being in the choir, I think what what came through to me more, was more the the atmosphere and the environment of the cathedral, the architecture, and uh, that affected me more than the music. Uh, New York City was different then. This was uh, I was born in 1966. I'm sure a lot of you know. Uh, it was grittier. There was uh, mm, <laughs> I don't know. I won't say lawless, but there was less <laughs> less rule following. Anyway, it seemed like people riding on the backs of trains and, and uh, uh, buses and, and, and painting on the trains. I'm sure a lot of you recall this, uh, this New York. Anyway, after, after uh, graduating from cathedral school in eighth grade, I went to the Stuyvesant High School uh, for high school. Oh, uh, you will note it also has a beautiful stone carving on the outside. At least the old building did. It, it no longer is in this location. Uh, on 15th Street and between first and second. Now, now it's in uh, Battery Park. Uh, Battery Park, anyway. Yeah. So uh, after after Stuyvesant, I I went to NYU, which is where I graduated. And <laughs> you see another uh, of our wonderful uh, stone carving uh, New York City achievements uh, right in the right in the center of that campus. And by the time I finished my uh, academic career at at NYU. I graduated with a degree in math. I'd become completely uh, burned out on sedentary academic pursuits. And um, especially after Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant is, is like a really exhausting uh, academic experience. The, the uh, From my point of view, they push way too hard and assign way too much homework. Uh, and um, it just burned me out on academics. So at this point in my life, I was a little bit terrified of the idea of moving forward and finding something that I, I actually liked, as I, as I mentioned, that was something that was instilled in me, that, that I could also earn a living, that had nothing to do with anything I'd been exposed to so far. Now, I had been exposed to the, the stone yard. I think that's the next slide. Yeah, okay. This wonderful gentleman is uh, Dean James Parks Morton, and he was in control of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine uh, during the whole time that I'd known it growing up. And one of his uh, innovative visions was to resume construction. Now, the cathedral began, the cathedral construction began in the late 18, uh, 1890s, but they had stopped construction um, about 1941. And it was his dream to resume construction. And when he placed ads in local newspapers for uh, trained stone carvers to resume the work, he discovered that the whole industry had withered and there were no more people available, fully trained, ready to go because the industry <laughs> had not been producing skilled workers for, for decades. Undaunted, he he found expert stone carvers and stone cutters, stone masons in England and brought them over to train local um, youth. <laughs> uh, now this started when I was in the seventh grade and, and I became aware of it. I, I knew it was happening. It was a, a highly celebrated, it was in all the newspapers and, and uh, a great excitement, but I, I didn't really, see it as a personal path for me. Uh, I was I continued being a, a student and and trying to excel and and make my parents proud in the environment that I was, you know, in, which was strictly academics. And I didn't even think about it again until after college when I started to dabble in uh, woodworking and wood carving and, began to see that that was much more um, of a source of fulfillment and, and joy to me than than what I had been doing in school. So I uh, I applied to become an apprentice at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine Stone Yard, and I was accepted. That program started small. Uh, this is even uh, larger than it started. It started with one trainer and six trainees. And uh, 
it it grew. Uh, it continued to grow. By the time I started working there, it was about 30 trainees and I don't know, probably four or five uh, trainers. Uh, the next few slides show some of the people that I worked with. These wonderful pictures were taken by Robert Rodriguez. He's also doing uh, lectures and, and sharing his, his work currently. Uh, and um, he took thousands of, of, of uh, photographs of, of the workers at the cathedral. These are some of the people that trained me. This was still before I, I arrived at the Cathedral Stone Yard. Um, this is a good moment to uh, bring out the differences between stone masonry and stone carving. Uh, the, the, the object that this man is carving is a piece of stone masonry. That's uh, really defined by the fact that it's not his judgment. It's not being carved according to his judgment. It's There are templates that he that have been designed by the architects and designers in, in, in another phase of the work that were applied to the block of stone that he started with that guided all of his decisions, all of his um, processes were guided by these uh, templates. So it's not a creative uh, undertaking. It's a very, very skilled and highly, uh, uh, highly trained process, but it's not a, a creative one because the Everything is guided by the design, which is created by somebody else. And in that way, you can have a team of workers all collaborating on a project and their stones will fit together and, and work because they're following templates that are created under one uh, mind, even if it's multiple people. Uh, here's, here's, an, here's an example of stone carving um, because the design... Uh, is not guided by a template. I, you can see on the behind the gentleman uh, under the window. There's there's a, a a model which he created, which is guiding his stone carving. But um, it's not according to templates, and it's under his control. He's being creative as he does it, and he probably had extensive knowledge of stone masonry because that's a great way to begin. You you really get your chiseling skills, your stone shaping skills up to a very high standard before you begin to develop composition or expression or anything that would um, add to that challenge. Um, anyway, stone masonry is a great way to begin if you want to be a stone carver, but it's different. So this is me finally uh, in the stone yard with uh, two of my teachers. And this is probably my my most proud achievement that I, I had during the two years that I was a, an apprentice at the cathedral stone yard. Uh, this is an earlier piece that I did. Uh, and like the piece before it, it was not actually for the cathedral because when I was uh, being trained at the cathedral, a lot of the work that was being done was for outside jobs. And, and this these pieces that I'm showing you were for the uh, the, the Jewish Museum on Fifth Avenue. That was an outside job that was undertaken by the cathedral uh, while I was there. Uh, okay, so I left the cathedral stone yard. I left because they were uh, changing their philosophy and they were embracing mechanization. They were employing robotic uh, machinery to replace the work that I had been doing, you know, replace the, the, the human uh, aspect of the work that I had been doing. There were still humans doing the work, but they were much more highly skilled than I was. So my work was reduced to really something like drudgery that I didn't enjoy anymore. And having tasted this, you know, very exciting career and uh, totally uh, become passionate about it, I couldn't stand to work uh, and do what I was doing anymore. Although I'm very, very grateful for the time I had there learning what I learned, I had to leave. And the first project that I had as a self-employed uh, carver was in this building at 82nd Street and Fifth Avenue across from the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, it's called the Duke Siemens Building, or it was at that time. And they were doing a remodel they were creating apartments uh, where it had previously been a single uh, family residence. And I was carving fireplace mantles and, and, and stairway newel posts and, and, and railings at, in this building. 
I worked in the basement for, I would say, four or five years. And I, they even let me do outside things that, that weren't part of their program. Um, and it was a great experience. I was very, very lucky to have been able to work there and be uh, allowed to use that space as my studio. And um, I even got married there. I met my wife at this time and, and we got married in, in the building. Uh, this is one of the stair, uh, fireplace mantles that I made in, in the building at that time. And it, it's still in, the, actually, it was installed in the building, but I think it was moved later. The building has gone through several changes of ownership since I was working there. Okay, and uh, after I stopped working there, I found other work, including this is a, a monument for uh, the Spirit of St. Louis and Charles Lindbergh's historic flight. This is on Long Island in the same location where he took off on that flight. This is a, 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 a wall fountain in, in the backyard of a townhouse on the Upper East Side. Uh, and uh, <laughs> around the same time, my wife and I had became parents, and, and this is me with, with our kids. They're a lot older now, but um, it fits in at, at this moment in the slideshow. <laughs> I'm on a, we're on a ferry in, in the East River. This is a, a, a fountain that I created for a, a garden in, in East Hampton. This is a, a green man for a, a, a residence in, 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 in Greenwich. Another one in the same uh, series. And this is me uh, at work. Okay, so I, I was able to return to the cathedral because the Cathedral Stoneyard uh, construction project and uh, business that did outside work as well uh, closed down. And uh, the people who were running the cathedral after all the stone people had left, they allowed me to come back and become an artist in residence and use the space where I had previously been an apprentice and being trained. They allowed me to use that space for a studio, for my own uh, workspace and studio. And this is a, a, a slide of me in that space where I was for about 20 years working on a project for uh, Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. They, they created an arch uh, gateway and I carved panels for uh, decorative sculpture of uh, images of their mascot, the, the fox, and also uh, historical figures from the Hudson River history, um, which is where they're they're located. This this is one. This is the arch. You see the panel um, with the fox uh, that I was working in front of. Yeah, that was about um, maybe ten or ten years ago. Uh, here's a close up of of uh, one of the historical figures from the uh, frieze, I guess you could call it. In addition to all the other things I've done, I've done some gravestones. And, and these are the gravestones for Paul Moore and his wife. Uh, Paul Moore was the Bishop of New York and we became friends. And his uh, daughter, his, his daughters and sons uh, commissioned me to create gravestone for him, uh, which is in Stonington, Connecticut. And he commissioned me to make the stone for his wife on the left. Uh, so this is the fate of the the shed, the the stone yard, the the building where I was trained, where um where I used as a my studio after the construction project went out of business. It was dismantled and uh, taken to the landfill, and uh, an apartment building was built in its place. I have no grudge whatsoever against the people who decided that this was the right course of action for the cathedral because they were so generous to me and uh, their generosity made such a difference in my career and um, the decision to do this and generate income off the land rather than well th that that made financial sense and I trust that their decision was sound and uh, there's no hard feelings there I want to make that really clear so uh, after I left the workspace that I was given at the cathedral, 
well, I was <laughs> I was finally in, truly independent. I had to find a, a space to rent. I had to find a, a way to continue doing what I was doing, what what I loved doing, and um, without any support from outside. <laughs> My wife is a was a, she's retired, but she was a kindergarten teacher for 25 years. So I, I've always had her support. And and during times when I couldn't find commissions, she made it possible. I want to make <laughs> acknowledge her contribution, but I didn't have any outside support outside my family. That's what I mean. And around the same time that I made this transition, I also decided that I wanted to dedicate part of my energy, part of my life to not just building up my own skills and working, you know, in, in seclusion like a hermit, but actually bringing people in, especially young people, not just to watch me work, but also to train them and share this, you know, wonderful activity, which is almost uh, unknown today. And not just stone carving, but all kinds of handcrafts, all kinds of traditional handcrafts like metalworking and woodworking and uh, clay working. It's all becoming so pushed to the margins by by automation that young people growing up don't don't even know that it's something human beings do. And, and they, have, of course, they if they don't know that people do it, they don't know it's an option for them. So they don't have the ability to uh, have it be part of their lives as I have. And, and that's really, really uh, upsetting to me. And, and I, I've, I've ever since 20, 2015 or even a little earlier, that's when I founded the Pelletier Stone Carvers Academy. And this is my first, um, I guess, group of, of teenagers that I trained over, over a summer vacation. Here's uh, my friend Kita, Abubakar Kita, working on one of the carving projects I assigned with the comedy and tragedy masks. And uh, it's just a, a privilege to have worked with him. He, he, I've never seen somebody who was so brave to take on new challenges and, and pull them off so, so well. Uh, here's uh, uh, Santiago, uh, one of his classmates, working on uh, the flower, one of uh, one of our assigned projects. And uh, Crystal also working on the flower. And here's me working with a group of even younger kids at a craft uh, demonstration festival event where uh, craftsmen such as me interacting with the public and sharing our 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 skills and, and our, our enthusiasm, really. Uh, this is a, an advertisement for uh, participants. Uh, when I ran a, a six-month paid, a uh, four-month paid training uh, for veterans in uh, 2019. Yeah. Here is that group uh, of veterans. They, uh, they, they worked with me for four months. They got paid uh, full time, five days a week, and they went through the same curriculum, which I've considered to be my standard curriculum, which includes the pieces they're displaying, uh, which I call monograms, which is like a first step into relief sculpture. And this is a video of a more recent program that I ran uh, for the New York City Department of Education, where, uh, well, I, I'm just going to play it, and it's only about three minutes, so, uh, and please en uh, enjoy. I'm not sure if there's supposed to be sound, but if there is, we can hear it. Oh. That happens sometimes when you're trying to play. Well, it, it, it's just music, so yeah, I, okay. I'm, yeah. The first pro, the first project is well, I, I guess yeah, it's it's gonna. 
you can read it. <laughs> I think this is our, our last slide, uh, and it just gives you information uh, on how to find out more about the organization. Uh, but I want to I, I want to wrap up my uh, before we do questions. I want to wrap up by. I feel like people, I don't know that much about your organization, but I feel like people who 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 gravitate to it, probably do so because there are aspects of New York's built environment that you love and you want to preserve and, and stop them from disappearing. And because of that, what I'm doing with the stone carving tradition is, is not that different, except rather than preserving something physical, structures, I'm trying to preserve an activity. I'm trying to preserve basically something which to me is intimately linked to our human you know essence of who we are as human beings every animal has its own attributes that makes it special and humans have you know very nimble hands and dexterous uh, dex dexterity in our fingers and the ability to use hand tools to shape materials and our brains which are you know big for our size uh enable us to have language and to you know invent things and innovate and and not only that but to pass those things on to 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 young people so that they can learn from it and then take things even farther and that's the essence of a tradition that's the essence of a a, a craft tradition and we are at a point now where we're 
departing, we're, we're, we're deviating from our own nature. It's as if dolphins stopped swimming and, and doing acrobatics in water and started just acting like manatees and hanging there and and not following their nature. It's that that seems absurd, but we're doing that to ourselves as as a species. We're becoming almost completely sedentary and the things that make us special we're we're abandoning because automation just seems like the unquestioned progress. If you can create a machine that does something that skilled people used to have to do, it's just considered by most people to be a good thing. And, and, and that's progress. But I think it's not in, in all cases. In some cases it is, but in many cases it's not. And we're at a moment where some of these traditions are almost lost and, and we need to really appreciate them while we can and give children the opportunity to get some experience doing it even if they don't become professional stone carvers, I have no illusions that the people I work with will become professional stone carvers any more than kids who do little league baseball will become professional baseball players or kids who take violin lessons will someday become members of the Philharmonic or play in Carnegie Hall. That's not the point. The point is to enrich lives and to help people understand that Working with your hands and using tools is a pathway to fulfillment and joy. And even if they can't do it for their income, they can do it for passion and to, to enjoy and to feel uh, fulfilled. So uh, that's, I guess, my final message of uh, clarity on, on why I do what I do and why I'm so happy to have been invited to share with you and help you understand something which is rapidly disappearing, uh, just as as much of a, 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 a impending doom we sense when a beautiful building is 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 threatened for uh, demolition. A, a way of life is threatened for demolition. Uh, a craft which has been with us before the founding of the United States, before the before Christianity, the stone carving tradition was was in existence, and and that's threatened with demolition, not through malice, but just through apathy. So that that's my mission with the Stone Carvers Academy. And uh, I'm so I'm so pleased to have been able to be here and share it with you tonight. So I'm I'm happy to uh, go back and answer any questions about anything that might have come up during the slideshow or, or anything you, you want to ask me about unrelated to the slideshow. Thank you. Uh, what a question I had. So the the students that we're seeing, well, those like initial, um, you were saying the, the 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 first thing you have them work on with their initials. How long does that generally take them? Well, the the the, the program that was um, in the video, we it was like nine a.m. to to three p.m., and I think it took them two days to do the flat surface. That's the first uh, assignment. The second assignment is the uh, the initials, the the monogram, and that took I think another two days. And the third day we went to, I mean, the last the Friday of the first week we went to the museum. Some of them might have been finishing up on the Monday of the second week, but for most, I think it was a two day a two day project. Okay, and when you take on a project. Um, I know you were kind of talking about the difference between, you know, having an established pattern and kind of doing it more free form. How often when you are commissioned to do something, are you allowed to just be free form versus them coming to you with an established design? Uh, I'd say it's probably 50, 50. And, and there are varying degrees uh, of, of, you know, sometimes when people want me to create something, they want to see not only a drawing of it, but a model of it. So um, I, I can be creative, but when I'm actually carving the stone, I'll be more or less duplicating the model. Uh, I just did a, a portrait bust, which, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's not a, a, an, an invention. It, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a highly uh, challenging project to, to capture a likeness. Yeah. 
Uh, and but half the time, I'm asked to. Uh, I'm given. I'm given some parameters. Like with the Marist job, I was able to uh, help to develop the 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 panels and and the compositions that I carved. But it was not. It was not a complete like free sculpture. It was more like, well, we want you to have this representation of a fox and <laughs> like a frolicking fox and 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 so it's okay. that kind of a 50 50 like a mixture of of, of creative creativity and uh following a that's a interesting design. my uh my husband actually graduated from marist so oh. that was <laughs> that went in after he graduated but we went back to go see the school i think like two years ago so i've seen it in person actually it's oh. it's beautiful it was thanks. lovely thanks he was like, oh, look at this. <laughs> uh, I do think we have a few hand, hands raised. Uh, Jeremy Woodoff, um, if you want to put it in the chat or I'll mute yourself, whatever you prefer. Uh, sure. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It's very, very interesting. Um, I have a question about one of the tools that we see in a lot of the pictures, the, the very large hammers that are like white in color and very big round things. What is the what is the material of it, and what is the reason that they're sized and shaped the way they are? Yeah, well, there's a lot of tradition around uh, the tools that we use, mm -hmm. and they've found tools like that. It's a mallet. It's it's a striking tool for hitting the, the end of the chisel, mm -hmm. just like the hammer that's in the picture that we're looking at. Not right. just like it, but like you know, another way of hitting the. Uh, it's super traditional. So a lot of times an apprentice is introduced to these things and for about three minutes might wonder like, why is it designed this way? And what, <laughs> just the same, the same kinds of questions you're, you're asking, but as soon as, but very quickly, you just accept that that's what you hit with and you stop wondering why it is the way. And you just realize that it, it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So initially in the old days, they were made from wood, but you know, you, you can imagine beating the end of a, 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 a steel tool, the wood gets splintery and starts to deteriorate pretty quickly. So now they're made from that white, uh, I think it's nylon. It's like some form of plastic, which never, never splinters or falls apart. They last forever. Um, but it's just a very traditional form of, of striking tool. And uh, I I also use metal hammers, but there's some types of work that that just feels best to me. And I really can't explain why. And when I have, when I'm training kids or adults, I, I present them with all the options and I say, try them all and choose, use the one that feels best to you. A lot of times, one of the biggest problems when you're a beginner is the fear of smashing your hand when you're swinging the hammer and trying to hit the tool with with force. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people I feel like feel like that's less of a they feel more secure using the mallet, maybe because it's bigger than, mm -hmm. than a hammer like the one that's in this photograph uh, on the screen. Right. So part of it is psychological. The we're less less stress over hitting your hand. But there's other things too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Uh, we have one. Any chance St. John the Divine will restart stone carving on site? Uh, I sure hope so. I, I have no uh, control whatsoever over their decisions. I mean, I might have influence and I try to, uh, I try to, wave the flag of stone carving and, and help them to realize that um, part of the challenge is there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a misunderstanding that starting a small program means dedicating millions of dollars to a uh, resumption of construction. It could mean that, but it doesn't have to, it could just mean, running the kinds of programs that I'm running elsewhere, which, you know, are paid for, you know, I, I've found philanthropic support to pay for the programs that I run and they don't cost millions of dollars. 
and it would help i believe it would help the cathedral the cathedral is 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 uh i uh, well i i feel like they're struggling to find ways to uh bring new people up uptown to 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 enjoy it and to marvel at it and to uh appreciate it so having uh even a small workspace where people are carving stone even beginners i think would add a, a dimension to to the cathedral uh from a visitor's point of view, that would really, people would be just as excited about it as, as they were in 1979 when Philippe Petit, walk, who who walked across from the World Trade Center towers, when he, when he walked across Amsterdam Avenue on a wire to bring a trowel to set the first stone in place. It was so exciting and so many people still call, so many people still call the cathedral to ask about the stone carving program that's been closed for decades because it's so linked in people's imagination. Uh, so uh, I have, uh, you know, that uh, that's a question I get asked a lot, but uh, I think it's a, a question of priorities and, and, and uh, Dean Morton was such a uh, visionary and, and a person who, who never really worried about reasons why things weren't practical or couldn't be done. He was more like, Oh, this is a great idea. We've got to do it. So, now there, there aren't that many people like that around. So um, I don't know the answer to the question, but I hope it will be soon. And I hope I'll be able to be involved. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, someone yeah. else asked that they would like to take classes. Do you do adult classes? Is there a way to sign up for classes? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, uh, well, my website, my, my, my email is not on this slide, but it's uh, chris at stonecarversacademy.org. And we have a weekly class on Thursday evenings in my workspace in the Bronx. And uh, it's it's a, it, it's a class where I put participants through the same curriculum of flat surface, monogram, flower and then projects that they design under my uh, supervision and, and guidance. Uh, and it's uh, one class at a time. There's no uh, sign up. There's no like semester. It's not like you sign up for months. It's, it's you, you pay for classes uh, one at a time. So nobody has to feel like, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know, like obligated. It's, it's mm -hmm. one at a time. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, Thursday evenings, five to eight in the Bronx. Close, though. It's not that far. <laughs> you can reach me at uh, chris at stonecarversacademy.org. Uh, someone else says, the famed Picarellus. Um, not sure if I'm saying that right. I wasn't sure if it's wrong. Right. Was it? Picarelli. Picarelli. And others were Italian, as you are, I'm guessing, by name, coincidence or just long history? It's a coincidence. Uh, my family, yes, we have Italian ancestors, but I didn't pick up stone carving through my relatives. I was greatly inspired by my uncle, who who was a sculptor, but... Um, I've been to Italy as a tourist, but I never, I never learned anything there. I, I think it's a coincidence. And uh, yeah, the Picciarillis were uh, a family that in, in, in the time when they were uh, working, there was a huge mechanism where sculptors would work in clay and uh, they'd execute their sculptures in clay and have them cast in plaster. And then they would either send them to a foundry to be cast in metal, or they would send them to a stone yard to be carved and duplicated in stone or marble. And the Picciarillis were the premier uh, excellent uh, duplicators of, of uh, other sculptors' models. And some of the most famous uh, monuments in New York City, the Customs House, uh, the main monument at... at uh, um, Columbus Circle and many others were carved by them, but not according to their own uh, design. There are some which were carved according to their own designs, including the Fireman's Memorial on uh, Riverside Drive and 
105th Street or so. Uh, one of them, Attilio Pitcher, really became a, a sculptor and he was able to create the models himself, which he and his brothers then uh, executed in stone and marble. But uh, generally, during that period of time, the 1800s, early early 20th century, sculptors like Rodin, the great uh, Auguste Rodin, would work in clay and, and put his signature on marble sculptures, but he did not actually carve marble himself. St. Yeah. Gaudens, Augustus St. Gaudens, he would, Daniel Chester French, they, they, they worked in clay and had their sculptures carved in stone uh, by others. And that's not a crime. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but uh, that was the dominant practice at that time. Interesting. Uh, Jeremy, go ahead. I believe that um, Emma Stebbins, who designed the Angel of the Waters at Bethesda Terrace, um, did her own design and carving when she was in Italy. Although that's a that was cast in bronze, she also did stone sculpture oh. and carved them herself. Well, that's very exciting. I never heard that. I Thanks believe it, it didn't help her health wise, but oh. she did it. <laughs> yeah. We will actually be having a uh, program coming up about her. It's um, about a book that was written. So if you want to learn more, check out hdc.org. In a few weeks, we'll have it up. We don't have it up yet. So for for you, is it like just you? Do you have a staff? Do you have a team? Do you just do everything yourself and then separately you have the school? Um, I have this... Uh donor who has given me uh, given my organization funding to pay some of the trainees from past programs to assist me with current programs some of the people that you saw in in the slides as beginners are still with me and and they're they're taking their skills to a higher level and also teaching they haven't reached a level where they're able to teach independently but i do have help with with uh teaching programs and also some of the people that I trained are helping me with commission projects, including one that I'm working on currently in uh, um, Alexandria, Virginia. We're carving decorative um, images on the facade of a, a Catholic church, which like many buildings, many in New York City are built with the intention that the carving would be done relatively soon, but sometimes decades go by and people even forget that those blocks of stone were meant to be carved into some uh, sculpture. And um, yeah, so I have one of the people that I trained in 2016 currently assisting me on that project in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, okay, that's great. That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, John, who asked the, um, the Piccarelli question also put a link in the chat. If anyone is interested in that, it just says, um, comments about the Piccarelli's made clear and met collection. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, your hand is still raised. So is it raised again or did you have, uh, no, I just forgot to put it down. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? I apologize if I was too short. <laughs> There's 10 more minutes. It's no, that's that's okay. I'm very sorry to hear about your loss. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We all owe a lot to our parents and you know they helped us to see the world the way we do and <laughs> for sometimes for good as and for bad. But like like I said, one one of the best things I think that my parents passed on was the belief that finding a career that you enjoy is possible and that it matters and that it's a worthy, a worthy goal. And so, so often we see uh, politicians and others bragging about job creation, but they're not jobs that they'd want their kids to be doing. You know, <laughs> some of them yeah. are important and they need to be done, but uh, it's sad that not that many people feel that way about their work. Yeah. Yes, I, I very uh, thankfully agree with you. My parents also did the same thing. 
I work in preservation. My sister is a professional dancer. My other sister is a hairdresser. Oh, that's great. We all found uh, non-traditional jobs, I guess you might say. Yeah. Mm. But yes, very, very grateful. Uh, okay, well, with that, I I think we are done. Thank you very much again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, this is recorded. All of our other Preservation School classes are also recorded. Please do check out our YouTube channel. And as, as well, if you have any questions, just, you know, email me, let me know. Yeah, feel free to get in touch with me as well at chris at stonecarversacademy.org. Great, thank you. And good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.